As business owners, entrepreneurs, family men, it's difficult for us to find the time to put together projects like these. Even though it's something we really want to do, unfortunately, taking care of the things we have to take care of comes first. However, because of viewer support for people like you, we're able to continue doing this. Please consider joining our Patreon and supporting the Burn and Return podcast. Oh, that's interesting. Boys, we hmm. froze. Oh, I thought that was. I thought we got hit by it. You're listening to Burn and Return, a weekly one hour podcast covering news from the agricultural and turf grass industries. Welcome. Welcome, everyone, to Burn and Return. That was an interesting. I thought I'm. I don't know if we're on the same page here, Demate, but I totally thought the listeners of whoever heard our pre-show conversation tapped in and was trying to keep us from coming on air there in that headspace we were in. You know what I'm saying? uh, I thought. Well, it was that, or the the forces of buy my shit took out our NORAD, which is J Pink's house, and. This is going to be a full <laughs> nuclear assault. Yeah, are Maybe they, they are they the ones... DDoSing you, J Pink? <laughs> <laughs> Not that I know of. Is it? Are we in the midst of a denial of service attack? Is this a multifaceted DOS attack, and we're all all of it's, our computers yeah, are going to be shut down? It's all affiliate links. If you go to the Grass Factor, <laughs> being you get spammed with bar- affiliate bar- links, a Barney song on loop on just loop right there and then maybe if you stay long enough it'll turn into meat spin all right go on (laughs) everybody welcome to the burn and return podcast i'm your host my name is matt martin and with me i've got our two favorite cohorts mr ryan demay and ray ito gentlemen how are y'all doing tonight well it's been a busy day i got i got I'm going to do this and then stay up for probably another five hours trying to get stuff done because I'm going out of town this weekend, boys. I don't know if you knew that or not. Oh, snap. Did you know that? Did I freeze? Uh, I did. And, I'll, and I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about that here coming up. Uh, Ray, how are you, sir? Well, I'm uh, doing well, too. And I'm trying to clear out the uh, time in my schedule this week because... Instead of doing work uh, during the last half of this week, I'm going to be uh, right in front of this camera, it seems. <laughs> a yes, lot. I think that's a perfect that segue thing. into our, uh, our pre-show housekeeping here. Uh, first off, we have hit our first goal with the uh, with Patreon. So a big thank you to everyone there. So we're going to have a public Patreon special stream Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, thank you, everyone. That's why we continue to do this, so we get to remain loud and, uh, and independent. J. Pink, how did you sign off that that uh, that final email? It was beautiful. Loud, live, and independent. That is right. I love that. I was like, man, that that hits everything it needs to hit right there. Loud, live, and independent. Um. Then we are going to do a members only AMA uh, immediately following that. Right. So. If there's, this will be totally like a, you know, closer to a, a one-on-one type environment, very small group of people. And, you know, you can ask any of us the kinds of questions you want to ask, you know, like if you are interested in some aspect of Ray's private life that he may not feel comfortable talking about in front of a few <laughs> thousand people, then maybe he'll, he'll talk about it in front of, you know, a few 10. Or if somebody wants to know <laughs> how to make how to make you best utilize his tough actin to actin we can get real real nasty with how he he keeps it keeps everything so shiny head to toe and all the way onto the grass during the ama we are going to give away the venue details for our live show so if you have never tuned in a thirsty thursday we highly recommend you tune in to thirsty thursday that is what we're going to be doing live in Louisville, Kentucky at the GIE. We've got a whole 
dinner plan. I mean, it's just it's the whole thing. It's a whole setup. It's a, it is a show, a legit attend in purchase show. Like you're going to a damn movie theater, but not a movie theater. It's like you're going to a comedy show, right? Except instead of comedians, you get a bunch of, uh, well, you get one washed up has been and two people who lead very successful careers. So it's, it's incredibly exciting. <laughs> I'm, I'm the washed up has been. Y'all lead successful careers. Now, I just don't want oh. anybody to think anything other than that. Okay. Uh, and we're going to be giving away a ton of swag uh, for the Patreon members. In immediately afterwards, we've got swag. We're going to be giving away. We've got a full show. We've got booze in the lineup. We've got good food in the lineup. And, uh, and of course, it's going to be us uh, we, you know, putting together something a little special there to be able to, to present to you and hopefully make you laugh uh, and, 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 you know, just an, an evening of entertainment, right? What? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Sorry, I thought of something funny. No. You can say it if you want. No, it was a pre-show. It was a pre-show topic. <laughs> I just <laughs> went ahead through through a through a picture in your private chat. <laughs> Did you? It's power of the inter power you? of the internet. Oh my god! <laughs> it's on Wikipedia. It's not like it's difficult to find. I was just scrolling through, and I said, "Oh, is incredible." Well, I, you know, after watching that documentary, I never thought to check out the Wikipedia article, but uh, I'm fairly certain that's a bullet hole in their head there. Uh, in the in the show before the show, we were talking about Rasputin, and uh, apparently on Wikipedia, there's a picture of him with a uh, with a, a his corpse. That's that's pretty interesting. Um, burn and return. Right. We are going to be recording on a different night next week because of the chaos that is going to be the Green Industry Expo, and uh, and of course us, you know, having to plan this event to be up there. So. Um, we are going to try and get that done while uh, Ryan and I are together in person. We're not exactly sure when that's going to be, and we'll hopefully be able to announce that at some point. It, we may only have a couple hours notice to be able to notify you. So um, if you're not part of the Discord, sign up. Be, be a part of the Discord. If you're, if you're a Patreon listener, you know how to get into it. You do it. Go ahead and link it up. If you're a member on YouTube, go ahead, link it up, get into the Discord, and that way you'll have access to when we're going to be doing these things. Uh, because it's going to be difficult to individually reach out to to one person at a time to just tell them where we are. So anyway, that's a little bit, uh, again, just to highlight a couple of things there. We've got a thank you stream Wednesday at 9 p.m. Immediately afterwards, we have a members only AMA. Uh, the venue details are coming out during the AMA. We've got swag, everything we need to give it away. It's going to be a live dinner, show, booze, everything you could want above and beyond. We were going to be there for your entertainment on uh, on a, on, a, on what would be a special evening, our very first live show. Hopefully, the first of many more to come. That's what we've been working on since we're going to gauge and learn a little bit from this and then employ it to turn it into multiple shows. Am I right, Demay? Wouldn't it be fun to go to Austin, Texas or Vegas or, I don't know, L.A.? Who knows? You you get Madison us on the Square tour Garden. of us, man. I'll, 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 just, I'll just get out and talk to her wherever we show up, you know? <laughs> That's right. That's right. We are going to be the only traveling live comedy show that talks about grass and uh, and performs to thirty people. It's going to be amazing. We will have a tour Very bus intimate for shows. our thirty our thirty audience members <laughs> and the groupies. Yeah, oh, gotta have a group. All <laughs> oh, the groupies, like seven of them that are made up of our wives and our children, cheering us on. Get it, Dad. Do you it. Think you think that uh, Ray would bring Sheila? I sure hope he would. That'd be the right thing to Ray, do to settle up Sheila? after all. I think Ray had to take a call real fast. Oh, okay. Well, probably we for Sheila. Ray would. She probably said, listen, if you're getting on that tour bus, I will rear end you again if you don't. The man, I've got a serious question. This is serious. All right. All is right. this going to be the breakout that puts Ray? on a short list amongst hundreds of women. It's very possible in the greater Louisville area that this could happen. I can't say I think so. that, uh, that, uh, you know, that's the first stop, right? You know, like, uh, there's some of those, those early tour stops in Germany that the Beatles weren't invited back to because they were, well, you know, a little too social, you know? So maybe, you know, this could, if he were to come 
anywhere inside of the continental United States, I would say that, you know, it's, it's, it's unlikely, right? I think he's going to have to go international. I think we're going to have to go to Canada. I think we're going to have to go to maybe Russia would be a good one. Just trying to think of where Ray would fit in best because you know we're really going to he appeal means- to that Louisville crowds. You know it's it's tough to say. It's tough to say. You, you know Ray likes um, what is the word I'm looking for? Structure. You know he's he's very structure driven driven. Yeah. And and so I could see you know the 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 women of Canada, the women of Russia. And what's interesting, I'm I'm kind of pulling up the um, the analytics right now for. Um, for our show and i've got to say gentlemen we are we are international if you if you did not know that <laughs> i didn't know that we are doing very well internationally it's amazing it's uh it, the, the the reach is much greater than than youtube is and i just can't help but think about how impre- how awesome that is truly really um that we are you know we're we're international and i think that the international audience New Zealand, the UK, Canada, Australia, uh, Denmark, Poland, Bulgaria, Italy. And this, this, I'm not talking about a single listen. I'm talking, we have multiple subscribers from these areas. The Cayman Islands, Mexico. We, we, wow. We've got reach. I think that, and I don't know what the male to, to female uh, audience is, but I would say we're probably, <laughs> what, 80, 90% female. And... Uh, and you know, so I think I think there's going to be a significant number of of women here that see this opportunity with Ray and just hope to capitalize on it. You know, well, and he's you know, he's catch. Nick Nick made Nick Nick made a, a good point in the in the thing here is how are you going to pick Ray up in that bus if he's on the island? And I'm telling you, this is where VR steps in, right? Jay Pink is an all world IT guy. He will figure out how to get whatever we need to do vr wise hooked up right it'll we'll feel just, like the real thing we'll get like a the car, we'll move the cardboard cutout to one of those segways and we'll give ray control over moving it and we'll just put a screen <laughs> at, like an ipad pro or you know some big tablet at the top solved yep yep just be the segway running down the street with a cardboard cutout just, array you gotta need the biggest ipad you can get to fit that hog so all right let's go to the headlines here are we done with are we done with everything or what? Boy, this has been uh the 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 last you know ten years have just been the Asian invasion, right? And I and I say that colloquially <laughs> with love. And uh I hey, listen, I can, you know, I I'm I'm married to an Asian woman and I uh, have beautiful uh, Asian children as well that are mine, by the way. Uh, so I had a conversation. This is no lie. I don't want, I'm just interjecting with everything that's not burn and return related here, but we're off the rails. So it's okay. I've, I, I, w- I worked with a guy on Friday, right? And we're out, we're, <laughs> and he, he, he's an older man. And you know how old people just do not, you just don't care, right? Like they're like, listen, I've put my time in, I worked my ass off and, there's just certain things I'm not going to fold for the rest of society. Like, you know, when he needs to go get his Coca-Cola and his, uh, and his cup of water from McDonald's, he's going to take his whole truck and his trailer that he pulls behind the truck through the drive through because, because who cares when he's parking to get gas and, uh, that trailer's hanging out, you know, it's just going to hang out there and people are going to have to figure out how to go a different way. In the same instance, we're in draft through, right? And, uh, and and he's asking me, you know, how my kids were now and all this fun stuff. And then and he looked at me and he said, by the way, are those your kids? I was like, yeah, <laughs> dude, those, are, those are my kids. And then while he asked me that, though, the lady in the drive through is asking him what he wants for his order. And I'm like, she's trying to take your order. But he's asking me if these are my actual kids. And so I answered and said, yeah, these are my kids. And then he turns around, he takes, he, he places his order. She starts reading it back to him and he turns around to me and he goes, yeah, I just realized it. Did that offend you? I I didn't intend to offend you, but I just, you know, was I offended? And she's asking him another question or something. And he's just completely zoned out to it. I'm like, Steve, trying to, and then he just drives off. 
<laughs> towards the window. Uh, but I, I was not offended. You know, I had a 13 year old kid ask me at uh, Ingalls one time if I adopted my children. So, you know, it is what it Just is. Tell them no, they adopted me. <laughs> um, amongst the the Asian invasion and all the fun things that come along with it, there's been some interesting things that uh, as um, uh, the shrinking of the size of the globe. And what I mean by that is that we have it's much easier to touch the, the farthest places of the globe where previously it may not have been so accessible has brought an interesting dynamic in the world of biology and especially entomology. So we are experiencing things like um, uh, uh, what is it? The Asian longhorn beetle, the spotted lantern fly. Uh, what is the one that it, the uh, emerald ash borers and, ash you know, these are yep. originating from Asian imports, right? Well, guys, I got bad news. We got another one. Uh, oh, if boy. COVID, what? Oh, I shouldn't have said that. If uh, <laughs> in, in the gardening world, in the gardening world, <laughs> shut up, Matt. Shut up. <laughs> It's going to take J-Pink three hours to edit this damn thing. Boys, Live we've the got tape. the dreaded Asian jumping worm. And if you haven't heard about this, this is this is something absolutely special. And I'll, I'll jump into here. After decades of improving my garden soil, I have an infestation of Asian jumping worms. And I need to burn it all to the ground. They eat all the organic material in the soil, depleting it terribly. These foreign invaders multiply more quickly than our common worms, outcompeting them. Everything I've read about them says they are bad for gardeners. Scientists are working on an organic solution for them, but good effing luck is what I hear most of. Uh, that was not an actual quote. Um, their worst impact may be the forest. They eat dead leaves, forest stuff, and potentially creating a soil devoid of organic matter that nurses native wildflowers and trees. The soil can become sterile. Uh, to see if you have them uh, start at a shady mulch bed, this is where they like it best. Pull back leaves on your mulch. The worms are surface feeders living in the top inch or two of the soil and readily seen on the soil surface. Touch one, and if it moves fast, quite a contrast to our relatively sluggish, ordinary worms. The infested areas often look like coffee grounds are spilled in the soil, which are their casings or excrement. Um, then it kind of goes into more detail here. I, highly, I highly recommend you look into this. I've been hearing more and more of this taking place in the Northeast right now. And people in the uh, in the Northeast act actually losing their mind over it because they are uh, wreaking havoc. So, boys, now we've got the Asian jumping worms. And what I looked for specifically was information related to turf and the impact they could have on turf. But as we all know, turf is, you know, mighty fine at adapting to various types of situations. We oftentimes grow turf in soils devoid completely of organic matter. And uh, and so, you know, is this something we should be concerned with? Is it is it something we should just, yeah, it's a it's another scary headline. Move on with it. Um, you know, what what are your thoughts, Ryan? Be honest, I'd never heard of this pest before you linked the article and did some reading on it. And uh, you know, I think the same thing. It's hard to find anything specific to turf, which lends me to believe that it's not causing, you know, commercial or economic damage to the, to the extent that we need to have some type of management strategy, even, even though we don't really have a quote unquote legal management strategy for earthworms, right. That are considered pests, right. So whether earthworm castings are just, you know, uh, extensive earthworm activity on turf sites that we don't want to see. You know, there's really not a whole lot that we're going to be able to do here. Jay Pink, can you throw that one photo up that I, I sent you real quick? I thought this was interesting just on the ID characteristics here. Jay Pink. Uh, yeah. Can you can you do it? Oh, okay. Cool. I'm making sure I didn't freeze or if the nukes got you finally. Okay. So the big thing here is going to be this white. I don't even want to say that word. Say it. It'll get say cut it. up. I'm not saying it. I'm not say saying it. it. I'm not saying it. I said all my bad words before the show. Silicella. You guys can figure it out How about yourselves. That? Uh, that's not. That's definitely not the correct pronunciation. But we'll go with it. So it's this <laughs> no, whitish it's color. It's called a clitellum. <laughs> <laughs> there. Welcome back, Ray. I, Glad you're I can here, say sir. it with a strip. I can say it with a straight face. I mean, you see, I have a clean mind, Ryan. <laughs> I do too, but I don't want somebody to cut it up and be like, ah, we got gotcha. you. No, I don't want that. These so, okay. Boys. 
<laughs> yeah. So uh, <laughs> now I'm thinking of a Seinfeld episode where he's uh, dating Dolores, you know, and it rhymed with that. So I, I don't know, Ray, this ID characteristic I thought was interesting. I also, from what I understand, reading some of this other stuff is they thrash quite a bit when you pick them up. It's a little bit different mm -hmm. than a nightcrawler. It doesn't really wiggle around too much. So one way to tell them apart. But have you ever heard of these things causing any type of major damage on turf grass in particular? Not here in Hawaii. Uh, I get a lot of earthworm issues uh, actually in residential lawns from the European species of uh, earthworm. But Oh, for sure. Uh, That's what we were talking about leading into this was that it was, uh, you know, that there's really not a whole lot of uh, labeled earthworm controls, right? So even if you have these things, what are you going to do about it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's nothing labeled officially, but uh, all of the old-time golf supers know exactly what to do. And in fact, uh, mm -hmm. Ryan, I was talking with one of my friends who used to be the golf super at that uh, golf course that is now the golf school. Mm -hmm. And we were, we were comparing notes and I told him, I love that stuff. I remember that stuff, but we can't get it anymore because that got taken off the market in year 2000. Yeah. It was really good, yeah. but can't Actually, use it anymore. I Probably still being used well, somewhere in the world, I'm sure. No, I like that product for cinch bug, grubs, and army worm. Okay. But I'm a little bit jelly because apparently that product is still allowed in Australia on turf grass. Really? Yeah. Well, you know, you they do things a little that. bit different down there, right? It's okay. You let it. I know. You know let it. Yeah. Let it ride. Yeah. Mm -hmm. let, let it ride here. Oh I man. Wonder, so go. Here, here, here's a serious question. <clears throat> you know, we we have. I think. I think. You know, emerald ash borer is obviously a, a, a pretty big thing, right? Um. You know, I I wouldn't quite equate it to the same level of destruction as uh, the Dutch elm disease was. Um. You know, we also have uh, what is it, the woolly adelgids on uh, on on one of the trees too. I can't can't remember which one they're wreaking such havoc on. Um, but if it, realistically, realistically, is it possible that these could cause widespread widespread destruction to forests? I mean, if you think about it from the standpoint of okay, it mass consumes, um, it has no known natural predators. Well, it does have natural predators. Uh, probably not the same ones that are accustomed to eating our European counterparts that you know they grew up on this. So they move a little bit faster. So what normally goes after it may have a tougher time going after it. Uh, so basically, their population allows to run a little bit rampant, and say it does multiply in our forest. Forests have a fairly uh, efficient system of taking care of themselves, right? Uh, the uh, forests just know how to get it done. And it, but we, where we do see destruction of forests from natural sources, right, is oftentimes like a foreign invader, such as Dutch elm disease or um, uh, the emerald ash borer or um, the Asian longhorn beetle and all, the, all these fun things that are starting to show up. But now that this is not species specific, and and just targets uh, the soil. Is the forest going to adapt and find a way to maintain this before widespread destruction takes place? Are they that powerful, or is it one of these things? It may wreck a few gardens. You know, you get out there, you you apply your dialogues, or what? I, I shouldn't say that, but uh, you go out there and you do your corrective action by whatever means necessary, and then you go on with your life, and no big deal, no harm, no foul. I'm just saying that they. You know, they've been around since the late 19th century here in North America, as I understand it. So you got to figure if something catastrophic would have happened. It would have happened. It would have happened by now. Yeah. Yeah. So I would consider this a nuisance pest. And yeah, I understand in the garden where it could be a commercially uh, 
bad thing, but not necessarily on turf grass. Po the the ultimate and original poverty plant, right, Ray? Yes, yes, totally. Well, that's I, good. I mean, that makes me feel good about everything. And that way, when people see this, you know, they're not all having a panic attack that, oh, my God, I got Asian jumping worms. It's the end of the world. Um, let's check out the next one here, because this one actually may have a little bit larger implications. And that is the John Deere workers are out on strike. If you did not catch this in the news, you probably weren't paying attention. And I don't blame you. Uh, however, uh, this is what's happened. Uh, United Auto Worker members walked off their job at John Deere at midnight. Our cameras were there early this morning as the workers grabbed their picket signs. More than 10,000 United Auto Worker members nationwide are now on strike, many of them in the Quad Cities. It's a strike getting attention at the White House with thousands of workers off the job in protest of a potential new contract. This past year, John Deere saw its most profitable year, making nearly $6 billion. And employees believe their wages don't show that, along with raises union members wanted to see pensions for new hires. And they also heard from Deere and Company today. The company said salary workers are in roles normally handled by the UAW right now, while Deere tries to keep operations going. Uh, Dear Vice President of Labor Relations, Brad Moore, said they will keep working day and night to understand their employees' priorities and resolve the strike while also keeping operations running for the benefit of all that serve. Um, what are the implications here? And, and I, you know, I brought it up, this topic again, by another uh, uh, headline in the Burns, uh, because I did read a little bit more there. But I'd say from a headline perspective, what are the immediate implications here? And then we'll talk about why they're going on strike uh, as we move into the article in the Burns. How about that? What, how does this affect us in the industry? How does this aff affect um, supply chain, all that fun stuff? The, the issues we're already facing right now, how does this compound that, if it does at all? I mean, you already were what? probably a good six months out on ordering a tractor today and not seeing it until, you know, next spring, maybe even summer. Right. So I can't imagine at our largest domestic factory that this is really going to be a good thing for anybody in the uh, consumer space. Right. And so, you know, I, you're right. We'll talk about it a little bit more in the, in the burns, right. The why, but, you know, I did find it funny that, you know, there were some uh, some different videos and different things, screenshots shared of um, the salaried workers running the production equipment. And I think like the first day, a salaried employee wrecked a tractor inside the factory array. Did not look <laughs> great. So, oh. you know, what, it's, it's a terrible position to put everybody in. Like, you know, clearly it didn't, wasn't just like overnight, hey, they're going to pull a wildcat strike and just walk off the job, right? Like, they had to know it was coming, first off. And second of off, you know, you're talking about, you know, having a meeting with the Bobs, and instead of them telling you you're fired, they're telling you, hey, guess what? You get to go work down in uh, the engine de department, right? Putting heads and cams and engines. What do you think about that, mm -hmm. Terry? Yeah. Okay. My thing is going to torque fun. wrench Terry. We're going to call you torque <laughs> yeah. wrench Terry from now on. How about that? Remember Terry yeah. Tate, office linebacker? Do you remember? You all remember that from the commercials back oh, in the day? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. ESPN. <laughs> they were pioneers at good stuff like that. What do you think, Ray? But, would you would you accept a tractor that was built by torque wrench Terry and? Uh, you know, uh, I don't know. I was trying to think of another good alliterative name, but I'll, I'll think she, of it. <laughs> and she definitely not, yeah, and, and not the, and not by uh, you know, Sheila either. Whatever she's doing, no thanks. But I've, in, heard, but in I've, any heard, case, I've heard, I've heard Sheila's pretty good at putting the Johnson rods in. Is that true? That's a different story. That's a different story entirely. <laughs> but. What I, what I see is this is basically what happens when uh, the management and the shareholders just don't give a shit about the people actually doing the work. Yeah, and we'll, uh, we'll get into that part of it. 
in the mm-hmm. uh, it, when we get into the burns, because it, 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 it at least one of the articles that Demay found, you know, was uh, was pre- pretty in depth about what exactly they wanted and what they expected. But let mm-hmm. me ask you this: Are we going to see this as consumers reflected in? Um, uh, is all right. Is this going to delay equipment that may be going towards next year harvest? And is this going to be another no. compounding factor? against our food prices that we're dealing with right now absolutely That's ultimately yeah. when i absolutely hear. it definitely will be yeah. I, I agree with ray that it definitely will be and then as we talk about the other stuff and the burns it's definitely going to impact the long term too you know so i i don't know i just you know i, I think you're going to see a lot of this and who knows where else this spreads within the green industry right that it, it affects um, whether it be ag or turf or anything in between, but certainly, right, there's going to be this reckoning of, uh, how do I want to say this, of social responsibility for, you know, corporations to take care of their employees, you know, especially now, because uh, regardless of whether they've got somewhere to go or not, I think people are just way more apt right now to just say, you know what, it's not worth it, and off they go. So, but I did read it. Well, I'll, I'll save that for the burns. I'll, I'll, I'll read an interesting article we can talk about there. So anyhow, Ray, if you need a new tractor out there in Hawaii, order a Kubota. That's what we're trying to tell you. <laughs> Which is a superior <laughs> machine anyway, in my opinion. Actually, uh, You're such I, I'm, I'm more familiar. <laughs> no, I'm familiar with a more obscure brand. Which it's one? It's obscure and Iseki. I've never heard of this. No, that's because Iseki is, is strictly JDM. But then a lot of Iseki was imported to Hawaii during the 1970s and the 1980s. I'm looking now. Wow. Products. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Wow. He's looks like <laughs> the old New Hollands. Except. Uh, is not it? Yeah. But except Isekis were basically tanks you know unkillable it's kind of like the old mahindras weren't they mm-hmm. didn't they have the same yeah. kind of reputation of of being just you could you could run it through fire and it'd come out on the other side just fine yeah i haven't no. seen a whole lot of good from mahindra recently yeah and like 30 however, years after, <laughs> yeah not, however, not so good recently Mah- however mahindra intended for export because in another time mahindra was only intended for domestic consumption within india am i right in mm, another time i don't know yeah in another time it, it was, was only that the initial... uh, yes because remember now with india's trade rules anything sold in india had to be made in india or else it was slapped uh... with like a, i think a 200% tariff or something else insane like that. Which is, you know, why Union Carbide uh, had to do what they did, which ended catastrophically. Jesus. <laughs> there goes Ray on the death dock. We finally made it. We Count it, finally boys. made it. Count it. Check. All right. <laughs> what else we got? All right, uh, and I'm just going to throw this up a little bit too here. Uh, Europe fertilizer plant shutdowns may turn permanent, group warns, and this is coming from uh, Bloomberg here. Uh, temporary shutdowns of European fertilizer plants in the face of soaring natural gas prices could become permanent, an industry group warned. Nat- uh, natural gas used as a feedstock for nitrogen fertilizers usually accounts for as much as 80% of production costs. Fertilizers Europe said in a statement Thursday, uh, the concurrent exceptionally high prices have already forced numerous plants to cut production and a toolbox proposed by the European Commission to address the shock doesn't go far enough in the problem, it said. If this situation is not addressed urgently, there is a real risk that temporary closures will lead to permanent closures or relocation of our sector outside Europe. And when I saw that, that was immediately what I thought is um, here goes the great uh flood of fertilizer companies leaving Europe as a result of this, right? Because I don't think the natural gas spigot in Europe is going to be turned back on with any sense of urgency right now, Um, at least without any sort of major catastrophic uh, 
uh, uh, realization, right? That, you know, okay, you know, people are starting to starve. You know, we can't, we can't import food or whatever the case may be. Then, yeah, I think they may turn it back on, but at least for, you know, all intents and purposes of what their plans are in, in terms of, uh, of energy. I just, I think, uh, I think a level of priority right now uh, and natural gas is too low on it. And that's why we're running into this. And unfortunately this affects a lot of, well, I say a lot, but some of the products we use here in the States too, you know, I, I always lean back on Yara because Yara is number one, one of the largest global companies, you know, fertilizer producers globally. And, uh, and they have made a significant push into the United States over the last five years. Um, you know, with Amidas coming online and, you know, I mean, they're, they're doing like paid social media advertising for Amidas right now. And for a company that size to be doing uh, Facebook ads for a product, you know, obviously <laughs> they're trying to make headway, you know, they, they're, they're trying to yeah. build a significant uh, brand recognition. there. Well, you know, they're shut down. They're not running any Amidas for the U S market right now. So I think for all intents and purposes, their plan is just to unload whatever they have on their vessel and then call it good. And hopefully they can get it turned back on. Uh, until then but if not you know what do they do do they here's the thing with with companies that size they can relocate it's a, it's a, the cost to relocate operations to the united states if it is turned off in europe is so insignificant for what it could be if they have to play under the european rules right and uh, so anyway i just wanted to get y'all's take on this you hear this um What do you think the right play is in the effort to be, I, I I'm all for, I understand the idea of green energy and I, I think it's great. And I think it's something we should all work for. Right. But would you be willing to sacrifice your fertilizer availability for green energy availability? Let me phrase it that way. And that's a very difficult question, deep question to answer. So good luck. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, not to get into, energy policy and things like that but right the, that i think there's a place that green energy fits right and in you will it will reference this in another topic that we're going to talk about here coming up in returns right how energy policy plays a role in decisions that are being made and how it's you can't just make these decisions in a vacuum right so to answer your question it's never going to go away. I don't think that you can, it, it, it's a complete reworking, right, of the logistics, the production, everything that goes into fertilizer on, you know, the six continents that use fertilizer. And where does that end up? Like when the music stops, who's going to have a chair? And Ray, quite honestly, my my question is, and the thing I'm thinking about is, what is the critical point for the United States to be in the same boat, right? And it won't, I don't think you're going to see it, you know, nationwide. I think it's going to be area by area, but if we see another, you know, deep freeze coming down through Texas next year, we've got, you know, plants that are down in new Orleans and areas like that, and they get cut off for a while. Like, what does that do to an already precarious situation? I think it is basically going to create the, crisis but then not right away due to stockpiles however the ripple effect is that again even domestically produced nitrogen is going to take a hit because by the way you know all of the anhydrous ammonia or most of the anhydrous ammonia that is used by the growers here in the united states most of that is domestically produced mm -hmm. so you know, that's going to hit. On the other hand, this is going to be something where this is something that I'm afraid of. I'm extremely afraid of this because you know where this, you know what this falls into line with, Ryan? What's that? The statement made by evil people called never let a crisis go to waste. Uh, In other wow. words, okay, what I'm saying about this is this fits into the anti-technology, the anti-progress, and 
the anti-people agenda. This fits in. Let's shut off the fertilizer. Let's shut off the industry. Let's shut off you know, food production. I mean, Ryan, I don't mm-hmm. know about you, but I still don't have the recipe to make tree bark taste good. <laughs> okay. How about a nice <laughs> bowl of centipede in the morning, Matt? Would you, would you lap up on that? A little two percent <laughs> no. in there. <clears throat> Fix it up. Be real good. You made me inhale my Powerade there. Uh, <laughs> careful, <laughs> just springing those words up on me like that. Boy, I don't. I don't think that. Ryan's even. I don't think Ryan's even talking about centipede grass. I think he's actually talking about Look at that centipede. The creepy. Cr- the creepy crawly <laughs> centipede. Yeah, you get a little bit of pro- you get a little protein in there. You, we can make a centipede yeah. bar. It's got all the centipedes in it, mixed up with I, some. You, protein. Know, you know, it's and it, it it's happening. And I, I, you know, I see insect protein becoming a real thing. I see it going into animal feed. Um, and it, and it's not to say that I'm even against that by any stretch of means of the imagination. There's people who have utilized insect protein as part of their diet. They're healthy and uh, and live. Hell, they have longer life expectancies than we do. Uh, but the thing is, is that if if this is some sort of forced manipulation to adjust that way, I don't know if that's the right way to go about it. I don't know that it's a forced adjustment. I, you know, obviously there's forces way bigger at play than we'll ever know or find out about, right? And certainly a big enough to manipulate a market like this, even as big as it is. But but I think but, in but, but what you know so here's here's the question I have right is okay we hit this critical point that it's no longer commercially viable to produce the fertilizers that we're used to right so where is the you know what's that gap look like in between like what you just said so like uh you know animal organs and other sources right that we have uh like you said insect proteins all this weird stuff, right? That nobody's really scratching the surface of because it doesn't make commercial sense to do it. It's not viable, right? But if you get to a certain point Meat where it's like, in okay, a petri dish. Yeah. Yeah. Lab, Are we going to get there? Meat, with- which is, it's a, it's a real thing that's happening right now. Is that going to feed the world? And there, you, you know, it, you're right. Exactly. Is there going to be enough overlap there for one to be able to replace the other? And, uh, I don't know. It's a it's a it's a weird thing we're going through right now, and it doesn't sh- produce a lot of these questions until you're teetering on the brink of it, right? And I think these are questions that are worth asking, um, and and you know perspectives that are worth pursuing, you know, for the sake of well, you know, when, when it comes to food production, we're talking about humanity, right? And uh, and what what value do you place on a life? I don't know. I, it's something I definitely have my head deep into. And the further I go into it, it's more, you know, how, how do you circumvent it? Because, you know, my initial thought was, well, this is where gen- genetically modified crops really get to come um, front and center. Uh, and and Absolutely. much more research dollars moving into it. However, I believe Europe has a big anti genetically modified crop thing going on, too. So, yes. Now you're doubly hands tied, and uh, in the sake of for the sake of innovation, I mean, I don't know. Capping innovation does not seem like the right thing to do in the midst of shutting off fertilizer. In, in I just want to from my perspective, yeah. I just want to yeah. get me a bag of that stress blend and eat that and let that potassium bring that blue green energy back to my soul. You know, that would <laughs> we could do that. Have some more of that in the world. Be good. It, it is potassium is the biggest driver of your skin turning green. So we have we have that to, to thank. Um, gentlemen, this week burn and return is brought to you by who? In in the in the in the face of what's about to go down next week, it's got to be the the patrons, the patrons, right? This week we are brought to you by the patrons. That is you guys, you guys who allow us to be loud, live, and independent. Thank y'all so much. We truly, truly appreciate it. If you guys bumped into us at an airport, would you buy us a beer? If you bumped into us at a, at, a, at, a, at a bar, at a restaurant, whatever, would you buy us a beer? I'd buy you one. I'll tell you that. If you would, consider signing up. Look, it starts at four bucks, or you can go all the way up to be a hardcore supporter. Whatever floats your boat. We don't wanna, we're not asking you to, to, to be put out by any stretch of means of imagination. And 
if it's something you don't like it, and, and you know what, you, you don't have the means to be able to do it, no problem. I don't. So it's perfectly okay. But if you are and you can, you care to, check it out. For those of you that are in the upper tiers, look, every quarter you get exclusive merch. Uh, you know, we, we, we were putting together little artwork things. They send it out and, uh, and you know, it's awesome. So it was just us being able to say thank you for allowing us to do this and continue to do this. And, you know, with the patron funds, what we are going to continue to do is scale the, um, uh, the site visits, right? We have, we have big plans for where we want to take this. It's obviously going to take time and a lot of capital. And that's where uh, we rely on the patrons. And, and a lot of that capital is ultimately going to be able to put us in more places and hopefully one day be able to conduct our own independent types of research. And that way, when people tell us certain things, we can call bullshit or nay bullshit or whatever the case may be, because, well, damn it, we tested it. Or, damn it, we met with that person and were able to get a definitive answer. Or, you know what, we got turf truth on our show. Who knows? All of those things may be on the chopping block. They may be on the table. And I don't know, maybe we'll show up in a town near you offering our own uh, uh, topics of, uh, of training. You know, maybe that's, that's where we're going. With it. So anyway, thank you to all the patrons. We sure do appreciate it. But gentlemen, let's move on to this week's Burns. Sheila was really riding the dog there, and it was uh, it made me uncomfortable, but not quite as uncomfortable as why this had to take place. The World Rugby announces law change with immediate effect to combat artificial pitch in, in, uh, injuries. And if I understood this correctly, artificial pitch is a European or some other country, not America, uh, how they refer to artificial turf. Um, and this is what they decided. All players will be able to wear tights or leggings in matches at all levels of the sport after the World Rugby Executive Committee approved an amendment to the laws of the game. Currently only permissible for women, Law 4 will extend to all participants with immediate effect, allowing the wearing of conforming tights or leggings on the grounds of player welfare and accessibility. World Rugby said the ruling was changed to reflect the growing worldwide use of artificial services at both elite and community levels amid concerns over injuries friction burns and abrasions woo world rugby rugby will also work with unions and artificial turf providers to ensure the best practice maintenance programs are observed however as they said bulls coach jake white admitted he was not a fan of artificial pitches after fly half uh johan johan goosen servant serv uh, suffered a nasty knee injury in the 29-19 united rugby uh, championship win over cardiff rugby at arms park and I looked up the image of that guy's industry, and they said it was a third degree burn on his knee uh, because of where he he slid across this artificial turf surface. And Damn. let me tell you, it was nasty, absolutely nasty. I didn't realize they did not allow tights or uh, leggings in rugby, and uh, you know, but. Here we go. Uh, artificial turf causing injuries again in another sport that is having to adapt and change the way they do things because, well, damn it, people keep installing this shit. <laughs> yeah, it, I don't understand you know, it. Why, it's, why it's, are people doing this? You look at the temperatures, you look at the, the, the knee injuries, the severity of, of, of injuries that, that occur from it. You look at the number of concussions that are occurring from it. Why in the hell are we still having these conversations? Because, Matt, people are dumb. People are dumb. <laughs> and they're dumb enough to look up all the bullshit on how Real grass is bad because, man, a lot of the athletic areas here in Hawaii, too, they're all artificial turf. Uh, a lot of the high schools here, Matt, they make a big deal out of putting in artificial turf. And in fact, the recently retrofitted uh, stadium at the University of Hawaii to where they play their football games. Guess what happened there? It all went artificial turf there too. If anybody's ever heard of Pilot, the uh, the gas company, gas stations, oil company. Oh, Jimmy! Um, <laughs> yeah. 
what a winner he is. Thanks for ruining my balls, by the way. I'll never forgive you for that. And uh, and the the scam you pulled on all the uh, the, uh, the the drivers, the foreign drivers. drivers. What a, oh, he didn't golly, know he did. What a scumbag! What an absolute scumbag! Uh, but the president of that company, who was also the former governor of the state of Tennessee, <clears throat> did this wonderful thing where uh, the public high schools he installed artificial turf for, and uh, and I'm sure it was some sort of PR. It was it was a gigantic PR campaign, and everybody was so Back excited. And, oh, look at him giving back to the community, and blah 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 blah. Well, what happens when you're? I hope I hope. Coaches out there across the country are aggregating the data to show what happens before and after artificial turf is installed. Before and after? Yeah, I mean, you know, I could talk for a long time on this topic. And I see both sides of it. I think there's areas where it does make sense, absolutely, because you have no other choice you're landlocked or you don't have that many fields or a number of different reasons but at this level of competition you know i'll say it this way that there really shouldn't be but here's the other thing you know that i hear a lot is that people will say hey you should take that extra money that you would save right for putting in a, a proper uh natural grass pitch and and use that to hire a good professional groundskeeping staff and I haven't seen a whole lot of people do that. And I, I don't know if that's just, uh, you know, organizations being scared of what that looks like and how to do it, right? And if you need help with that, I know some people. And the other thing that I see too is that, fellas, we're not, uh, you know, uh, going gangbusters here in recruiting and retaining new talent. I don't just mean like the... Uh, the weed eater guy on the crew or somebody like that. I'm talking like real management talent. You know, it's leaving the industry almost at the same clip as we're pulling, you know, good people in maybe a little bit faster clip, especially in sports turf, given the events of the last couple of years. So it's a really tough position to be in. And Ray, you're right. From a marketing perspective, turf has kind of got all the objections covered right now and natural grass folks and proponents don't to the extent that they could or should. And I, I think there really needs to be a reckoning on that side of things of, you know, you hear a lot of cries of, Hey, you should do this because it's safer. You should do this because it costs you less money and this and that, but there's nobody taking a really holistic view of looking at all that uh, qualitative stuff and also putting it with the quantitative side of what does this actually cost us? What kind of risk are we exposing ourselves to? by doing one of the other, right? And take it from there. So at this level though, it's abhorrent. It should not be this way at this level. It shouldn't be. And you are quite right in that there's a, seems to be like a, a professional natural turf uh, manager. My goodness, Ryan, seems like uh, that person is an endangered species. I mean, who do I know that is in that world, uh, you, uh, Spin Martin, uh, George Toma is a famous name, you know, in that, mm -hmm. but then otherwise, that's just an endangered species. And it comes back to how, like, even in, uh, even in, like, at the high school level, you tell sure. me, Ryan, what person would be interested in natural turf if all he knew was having to play football on synthetic well and right? i think that's how it's viewed it's that's, that's how it's viewed is that it's the easy button and you you just do this and that's that's the end of it right and what mm -hmm. you come to find out is that there is there is maintenance related to it absolutely there's maintenance and whatever savings that you're going to realize you're putting that much money plus additional money right sometimes even two times the amount of what you're saving um back into a reserve fund to replace that field and so can you commit to doing that I, and i'll say this too on the high school front is 
you know, I work with a range of different people in terms of, you know, their skill sets, their experience levels, uh, their level of just give a shit. Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yeah. so far, I can't tell you that there's been one that's not been successful just by, you know, showing them how to produce consistently good, not necessarily like great, awesome, whatever, pick whatever superlative you want, but just good results. And you'd be surprised how much confidence that that puts into somebody. Hey, I can do this. This isn't, you know, this isn't hard, this isn't, right? It's just, yeah, this isn't consistent. rocket surgery. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's the, the funny thing about that is, is like, for us and all the cool stuff we get to do is that you find out that Ray, Matt, that, you know, you get a good program rolling. It should be like groundhog day, right? Like you should wake up and it's, Hey, okay. This it's, uh, you know, uh, October 18th tomorrow. What do I got to do? You know, for it's the same way in lawn care. It's the same in everything. And so what I'm saying is just, this is that people need to take a harder look at this. Uh, you know, people that are making the decisions and that's the other unfortunate part is that they're not generally speaking, or they're not, they're not, there's not really a lot of good info out there to look at it objectively. So in the future, maybe things change. I mean, there was a reason that we got away from AstroTurf, the original AstroTurf, the nylon knit carpet, you know, 20, 25 years ago, right? Because it was hard on your mm -hmm. knees because people got injured because people got turf burn people, you know, it got hot, all those things. And there was a period where natural grass was king. I think someday it will swing back the other direction. Um, but I certainly see the need still in some places for synthetic turf. But overall, the majority of cases, natural grass makes the most sense in most cases. I'll tell you, uh, speaking of making sense, let's uh, let's right. pick up this conversation again about the John Deere strike. Okay. Uh -huh. And uh, we'll pull up this one here. Support for the John Deere strike saturates social media Thursday. Uh, it turns out it was one of the top trending uh, Google, the sixth highest search trend in the U.S. on Google, according to Google Trends. And a large number of social media users were voicing their support for the John Deere employees. Users also rallied behind the growing momentum of the labor movement as film and TV workers, as well as the Kellogg cereal factory workers had announced strike this month. Uh, also, Cisco, uh, Cisco, the food producer, is also on strike as well. And, uh, and why, you ask? I think this little caption here says, John Deere, 10,000 workers on strike. People need living wages, and the CEO pay went up 160%, and the employees went up 2%. We can be so better. So <clears throat> ultimately, it comes down to, uh, to listen. When, it, when, when you're talking about a company of this size, and, and I've got a bit of a bone to pick on this in some instances, um, when you raise CEO price by 160% and your employee price uh, 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 pay by 2%, those are not good optics. And when you're a public company like this, you're scrutinized to the most minute detail and things like that show up. And, uh, and that's why you hear the different types of things you hear, because that is not a good optic. My, where, where this it becomes a slippery slope is oftentimes this becomes reflected also in small business, right? Where the perception becomes that anyone that owns their own business is rich or um, is taking all the money and passing the burden on to all the employees. And it's always the employees that get wrecked and it's not the business owner that ever has to suffer from it. And that couldn't be further from the, cho uh, from the truth, right? I mean, they have the right to strike. That's not what I'm saying at all. However, it, this also, it, just, it permeates other industries. It permeates small business and it has, it has a ripple effect, right? And, um, and I can tell you that from a small business perspective, you know who gets paid first and who gets paid last? The employees get paid first and the owners get paid last. And, uh, and it, when you are a truly a small business that, or a startup that's trying to, to get things off the ground, a lot of times, uh, not only are the employees getting paid, they're getting paid significantly more than the owners of the company if they're even getting paid at all. And I don't think that narrative is talked about often. Uh, however, these are eye-catching and all that fun stuff. I just wanted to bring it up because I know I have been on the other end of that conversation where people were accusing me of, uh, of making mountains of money and, uh, and they're making, you know, $17, $18 an hour. And 
you know, you have to tell them, well, I haven't been paid in a month, you know? So uh, anyway, anyway, talk, talk, yeah. talk to me, guys. Talk to me here. <laughs> dig me out of this hole I'm digging. Well, so the first thing I thought that was interesting was that they hadn't strike. It hadn't been on a strike since uh, 1986, so 35 years ago, right, Ray? That mm -hmm. It yes. got so it got so bad at this point, right? That this this felt like the only way out, and so uh, you know that to me says something about what you know what they felt like was their only option. Number one, number two, with the the pay and all that kind of stuff. Like, listen, like it's kind of clear where things are headed, right? In terms of you can't be a, a dick bag company anymore and just, you know, court, promote or protect shareholder dividends, right? In the face of, you know, paying your employees or giving them decent benefits or whatever the case might be. And that doesn't necessarily mean that capitalism's dead and all this other, like, that's not what this is. It's just, you know, you got to understand that the, the the true cost of doing business is taking care of the people that make the whole company go right. Like, yeah. What is, yeah, what is, yes. what is John Deere without farm equipment and machinery and turf equipment and all that? I mean, yeah, there's, I'm, certainly there's other products people. they sell, but that's kind of the bread mm -hmm. and butter. Yeah. And there, you know, the bottom line is that a company is nothing without its people and I think that home truth has been realized even by employees and, and in mass because a lot of the employees, like in service, uh, you know, public service jobs, for example, they're caught in between under being underappreciated and, of course, uh, having to be COVID wardens. So guess what happens? They're saying enough already. Uh, I don't get paid to, enough to be a COVID warden and I don't get paid enough to even uh, afford the product or the service that I provide working 40 hours a week. So guess what, guys? Bye. <laughs> and yeah, and I, that's what I just come don't see how to. this, I just don't know how this, this gets better. Matt, I mean, do you, do you, if you're John Deere, do you come to the table and what's a reasonable offer and what's it going to take? And then you know how these go, right? Is that this, I'm not going to say it starts a downward spiral, but it's sort of like this, you know, um, one side's looking for a mea culpa from the other. And the, the thing I was going to say is I read this interesting article uh, earlier this week about they're calling them boomerang employees, employees that were so fed up and pissed off with the companies they work for in the last, you know, 12 to 18 months that they're now coming back. Like they had a chance to like take a break and kind of see the bigger picture. Be like, Oh, you know, it really wasn't that bad. It was just me going through a tough time. I don't know if this is what's taking place here. Cause it seems like there's definitely some broader issues at play, but it is interesting of just like, I wonder what some time away from the grind will do for these folks. You're on mute. You're saying bad words because you're on. <laughs> no, you're, you're, mute, not, yeah. you're not even here. You're not even sending us audio, Matt. I can't believe this is happening. Nope. Oh, man. <laughs> we hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Can you wow. answer? Can you answer in the form of a question? <laughs> um no i can't that's way too much pressure after that uh I, all right so to your question which i don't remember anymore because oh yes <laughs> kind of i do yeah so some some time away time away definitely puts things into perspective time without a paycheck uh shifts perspective and uh and I, I can tell you that even from a business, you know, we're all business owners, right? Some of us have employees, some of us don't. I can tell you that as really no matter who's who's in this position, if you go for a a a period of time without pay, uh you you recenter. 
right? And and you reevaluate the things that are important to you and the things that are not important to you. Is exactly like you said, is that what's happening here? I don't know. I've never worked for John Deere. I've never worked for the auto union. I've never worked for a union. The only plant or factory I've ever worked in is my own. But I can say this is where it goes from here and giving, given the, the state of the union and the amount of teetering, and, and this may not even be true. Sometimes I feel like we're teetering on the verge of chaos, um, but the normal indicators that we're teetering on the edge of chaos aren't actually there right now, right? Supply chain's messed up. We're having tr trouble getting some things. Fertilizer prices are going through the roof, but you know the cost of gas at the pump is increasing exponentially. The the food in, in grocery stores, grocery stores are shrinking what they carry in inventory. There's empty shelves all over the place. And that, that to me, feels like we're, we're you know, purely from a non-emotional standpoint, I see that. And I'm like, hmm, okay, this is weird. And I feel like we're teetering on the brink. But you look at the stock market, stock market's doing really well. And so it's, it's difficult for, uh, it's difficult to truly understand what the hell is going on. And if it, is this going to be the catalyst that caused the unraveling? Is it the, uh, is, is it the whole food supply thing that's going to be the catalyst for all the unraveling? I just don't know. But how many more hits can we take before absolute hell breaks loose? Is it, is it going to be, you know, someone showing intent of war? Uh, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. Are we teetering on the, it feels to me when I see this shit. I, I am I am legit nervous right now. I'll put it that way. I'm I'm nervous. I'm not prepping. I'm not storing food. I don't have a ration of MREs under the house. <laughs> but I am legit concerned. I'm paying attention. How about that? Yeah. Is this I mean, one okay. more thing on the list of things that, to pay attention to? There's going to be mass strikes, the uprising against corporate America. Even if there was, right? I don't think that's gonna that's gonna incite so much unrest that it would cause bigger things to take place, right, in society and all that kind of stuff. Like, not to get too deep, but I, you know, I think a couple of things. Number one, we're way more aware and hyper aware uh, in in force fed information about how bad things are, way more than any other group of people in human history has ever been, right? So. There's that. That can always ratchet up the anxiety. Number two, if you are a student of history, which we talked about our good friend, Mr. Rasputin here before the show, uh, mm -hmm. by the way, it's content you can only hear if you subscribe on Patreon, www.patreon.com forward slash burn return. Um, you know, if, you, if you're a student of history, you know that the world has gone through some serious, serious stuff, Matt. You know, famines, disasters, all that kind of stuff. And people just kind of marched on, right? They figured out a way to make it work and they marched on. And so I think that there's enough optimism out there. And this isn't me like trying to be corny or anything. I really do think there's enough optimism out there that, hey, you know, life's worth living and it, it's it's not all that bad. There's still something we can do or whatever. You know, if fertilizer plant gets shut down and, um, you know, food prices go through the roof, I think there's going to be some short-term pain. I think there's no question about that. But also, how far and how fast does this push the innovation, right, that we've been talking about that's probably been held back by the fact that, hey, guys, you don't really have a pot to piss in here with your innovation because uh, fertilizer's cheap, food's cheap, gas is cheap, stock market's at record highs, and nobody cares. So go piss up a rope. Those people are going are gonna to be working hard to insert their view, their worldview into, hey, it's so the way we do things now. I just, I, I have that level of optimism about all of it. Now, don't get me wrong. Like I said, tough short time, short term, tough times. There's still going to be shit bags out there. There's still going to be, you know, uh, some rogue shareholder at John Deere that says, you know what? These people, Ray, they can eat, you know, the field litter off the cornfields out there in the quad cities. And I don't care. Probably going to be people mm -hmm. like that. And, if there's pieces of shit in the company that you work for like that, then maybe you should work somewhere else. Yeah. Or and go buy a Mahindra. 
real, uh, real quick, Ray, it, Nick asked exactly what kind of change am I advocating for? What kind of war are you talking about? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not advocating for anything. Uh, I'm just asking a series of questions. What I'm asking is, I'm asking is, is this the kind of catalyst that could lead to war? Right, like uh, uh, you know, corporate America see is seen in disarray. It's an opportune time for someone to launch a strike against the United States. I'm just I'm throwing shit at a wall. No, here. I'm not, I, I'm not no. being I'm not being like a hundred percent like oh my god. Again, that's why I said I'm not storing MREs. Uh, I'm not advocating for any any change because it's not my responsibility to change anybody's anything, uh, and it's not my responsibility to advocate for change inside. Uh, 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 John Deere or the United Auto Workers Union. I, I don't know anything about it. I'm not qualified to comment on any of that. So I have no idea uh, what what needs to happen. I have zero answers to any of this. I'm still trying to figure out how to uh, how to, how to kill Dallas Grass. All right. So um, yeah, <laughs> Matt Martin, that's... Matt Martin. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you after you're done here. I want you to go read yourself a bedtime story about the People's Republic of China and their new hypersonic glide vehicle. That'll oh, make you rest easy that. tonight. <laughs> uh, don't, don't worry. Uh, so right, moving on. In, in the midst of that, let's lighten the mood here a little bit. And uh, <laughs> this article is titled, Fertilizer Fever, Soaring Costs Could Impact Farmers and Food Prices, Farm Policy News. But And I didn't bring this up just to talk more on the fertilizer aspect of this, but I wanted to talk about uh, the energy issue here and how that is a, it, taking place on a global scale right now. So about halfway down the, uh, down the article here after, after a large quote, it says, in a more narrow look at some of the specific impacts of the energy crunch in China, uh, Bloomberg writers Jeff Sutherland and Tom Hancock reported last week that in recent weeks, several plants were forced to shut down or reduce output to conserve electricity, such as soybean processors that crush soybeans to produce meal for animal feed and or, uh, oil for cooking. Prices for fertilizer, one of the most important elements of agriculture, are skyrocketing, slamming farmers already buckling under the strain of rising costs. Uh, the processing industry is said to be more severely affected than staples such as grain and meat. Uh, in the dairy sector, power cuts could disrupt the operation of milking machines, while pork suppliers will face pressure from a tighter supply of cold storage. Uh, in news regarding India, uh, India won't increase subsidies on phosphorus-based fertilizers and has uh, directed producers to re refrain from uh, raising prices. Interesting take from uh, a government there. Um, according to people with knowledge of the matter, threatening the firm's margins is global cost of the raw material surge. Uh, prices of phosphoric acid and ammonia used to make soil nutrient have soared in the world uh, have soared in the world market, putting pressure on Indian producers. Also, last week, look at energy issues in Brazil. Brazil's consumer prices jumped in September as gasoline, electric, food prices increased rapidly. Uh, lack of rain in some parts of Brazil has hit the corn crop, driving up the cost of cattle feed and meat, uh, fruit and vegetable prices. Uh, Brazil gets more than half its electricity from hydroelectric sources and scant precipitation for more than years left reservoir levels low and push power companies to use the more expensive fuel fired plants. The rising cost of oil driven prices, uh, fuel prices higher and truckers and farmers and other uses of diesel fuel and gasoline are passing their higher costs on. To us. So, you know, this is this is occurring. I, I mean, how bizarre is this that all of this is occurring on a global scale? Unilaterally. With the, along with the United States right now. And, you know, I talk about like, is that going to create a more opportune time to attack the United States? Probably not because they're facing their own uh, uh, energy crisis and fertilizer and food crisis and processing crises uh, that, that we are right now too. So when I say that it is positive, you know, we're not standing in the, the deep water alone here. Uh, there's a lot of people. Let's just hope that no one is pushing down others to stand on their shoulders. So one drowns and the other one floats, right? Yeah. I, you know, here, here's another situation, right? Where we're, we're looking into the belly of the beast, right? And I don't know, Matt, like, how do you, how do you reconcile this in terms of, um, you got all these problems, right? And, from a standpoint of let's bring it down to our level, right? Like I understand the food supply, the energy crises and everything like that. But in terms of us, like what is this going to mean 
in 2022 and beyond, right, for, for lawn care. And I know we kind of hit into this with Dave a little bit on uh, this past week's Thursday, Thursday, but I really do believe that we're going to have to find some different ways other than just your basic commodity lawn care program that's been followed for decades, right? I really believe that because it's just, I don't see how that business model plays into this type of future. And especially it's one that doesn't play very well with um, very volatile markets, right? And volatile pricing, not just in fertilizer, but heck in labor, right? Like somebody could come in and, and, and say, you know, hey, guess what? I don't want to make 15, 16 bucks an hour driving a true green truck around. Too bad. And now that, you know, that threatens their business model too in terms of volume. So I don't know. I mean, if you like, uh, here's, here's my question for you guys, right? Cause we've talked a lot about the big picture, the global scale, everything like that. Let's bring it back down to the ground level and the people that are listening here typically, right? If you had to make a bet today on what the business model that would be most profitable in say five years, what would it be? And what are some things you would do to get ready to start changing for that and moving towards that in lawn care? I'm serious. It's a, it's a, it's a worthwhile question. We're talking about war and you know, all this other stuff. Let's just talk about putting food on the table, right? Like, is it going to be the same? You can, and if you think that, and if you think that things will calm down or whatever, I don't, but if you do, that's fine. I'm not going to judge you. I'm just curious if you had to bet. And if you had somebody who had a gun to your head, a million dollar briefcase ready to hand you and say, Hey, I need to know five years from now, where should I be? And what steps do I need to start taking? What's your answer? Boy, that's heavy. I'm serious. <sighs> yeah. I don't know if I can come up with an answer that fast. I'd have to think about it. I'd need you like think a about that. You guys think, think you guys think, think about that. This. I do want to talk about you know, that. So you all think about that. But Ray, what do you got? You know, what I got is, as is, uh, you know, being in my location, the, mm -hmm. the concept of commodity turf care is just uh, a non-starter. I, I never know, you know, I, I, that never entered my mind. However, uh, there's a there's a verse from a George Michael song that is prescient in my mind. When the Christmas. rich become poor. Oh, I when thought you were going to say you got to have poor. I thought you were going to say you got to have faith. But. No, when the rich become poor, that is something that uh, I think about and I'm not sure what it have to do, you know, in that case, I mean, it's uh, it's just something that I think about because right now, all of these uh, you know ev world events are not exactly affecting the circles that I run in. Same. However, yeah. However, however, Ryan, if there's more trickle down effects that then affect the circle that I run in. You know, when the rich become poor, mm -hmm. that's when I'm in trouble. I'm in huge trouble. I understand what you're saying. And I think there's something to be said for, you know, it moving towards a couple different places, right? So um, number one is what you just said. Uh, fewer customers, higher margin, and you get really selective about who it is you work with, right? And try to mm -hmm. buffer that, that risk that, hey, maybe they do become poor or something like that by choosing your customers as wisely as you can. Yes, work, and I think that is can... a growing trend. I think that is a growing trend. You see all the, uh, uh, and I'll use this term loosely, but uh, the, the lawn care influencers so to speak on the actual business side of lawn care and i'm talking about mainly like mowing companies and stuff you'll you'll talk about the way they they vet customers now and uh and put them through a a series of, of questions to understand the scope of what kind of relationship they want uh customer vetting so to speak 
I think that is Man. that is becoming a thing uh, and has been, you know, for the last five years to without a doubt. Sure. And I think that's Matt? any any service. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ray. Go ahead. Matt, vetting my clientele has been basically a cornerstone of my operation ever since I've been in business. You know, that's just been the, how much you how, got. How buddy. I am. Yeah. No, no, no. It's got. It's not, it's not a matter of how much you got. My question becomes, and I will actually ask people point blank: How do you afford to one live on this property that you are on right now? And number two, I had better like my answer regarding. You know, regarding that, I'd better like the answer because in 2008, I got royally fucked over. And you know how I got fucked over? Bunch of Bertie Madoff worked... people living in Hawaii? Oh. No, no, close. I, I, I worked for a couple of customers where their entire subsistence was based on the stock market no stock mm. market and See, after I, that i, I picture, learned yeah yeah I it's learned. not a good place to be <laughs> gotta diversify no, no I, totally I was picturing and... peter north walking out of a hawaii mansion and saying yep i'm the only guy that ever had a blizzard issue warning issued for southern california so <laughs> right there boom uh you know, the other thing in, in a couple of uh, Tifway lawns and Chuck mentioned this in the chat here, if you're not following along, but they talked about automation. And I think there'll be a big push towards that. How that gets implemented in people's idea, that business model, I think so far uh, have really no clue in reality how that's going to work. I think it'll be interesting to see how it flushes out. But I do think there'll be several different levels of that kind of how lawn care is today so to speak from high end down to commodity base so it'll be interesting to all watch it play out but I, that's why i was curious with this thing is you know there's a lot of stuff going on so if you're a smart business person right you're whatever's here and now right you've already done fuck that up you got to be thinking a year in advance two years in advance three years in advance five years in advance and so it's got me thinking hey it's coming down the pike here and how do i either you know to raise point how do you get you know, diversified enough to, you know, spread that risk out a little bit across your client portfolio or across, um, you know, just what kind of services you offer, whatever the case might be. But also, right, how can you innovate? How do you, can you stay ahead of the game before it eats you up? So, Listen, all that, you know, all that when it, destruction when it comes to automation, that. though, you, you th think about it, think about it. Automation has just, has, bled so far outside of manufacturing now right um mm -hmm. where how many i don't know if you you have tried to go into a, a mcdonald's lately and there's no yep. one that works the registers anymore um yep. you know that that's become completely automated it it is becoming a thing right and uh and if we don't have the labor force to even support you know the number of jobs we have now then so be it right and uh because um you know, I mean, if we can't if we can't staff our companies, then we've got to do something to adapt. And here's the here's the other thing too is, uh, I yeah, I'm, I'm never mind. We're not going to go there. Actually, gentlemen, let's get some positivity in here. Let's actually talk about our, yeah. our uh, returns. La, 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 la. Gentlemen, it just, it's the gift that keeps on giving. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about the fastest lawnmower record is way faster than you think. Tony Edwards, who lives in the United Kingdom, is sure to be the talk of his neighborhood. He just won a world record that is the biggest dad move, the ultimate bragging points. Tony, uh, Tony recently set the record for the world's fastest lawnmower, and he built it himself. Clocking, clocking in at 100 43 miles per hour. 
His world record uh, world breaking no. <laughs> world record breaking lawnmower it took him two years to build. He completed the build in April of 2021 and made his official try for the record in August of 2021. Uh, his path to the ultimate dad record didn't come cheap, though. He spent close to forty-one grand on this hey. quest. Wow. His lawnmower is called Moa Busa. Yowza! Uh, this is good. And speaking, grand. yeah, yeah. Speaking of uh, innovation here, you know, hey, we still have the expendable capital, <sighs> expendable capital to be able to build a forty-one thousand dollars world's fastest lawnmower. So. You know, that is cheaper. That is cheaper than some of the lawnmowers that are out on the market right now. I'm impressed. I think I think that's a I think that's a fair price. I guess, but I I I just don't know about that. You know. Well, you know, he made a lot of money uh, as an executive of uh, of John Deere at the expense of his workers, and uh, and now he's just riding <laughs> off in, in peace, building badass lawnmowers. He's going to rip past the picket line here tomorrow morning, going 140 miles an hour. <laughs> See you in hell. Was that too soon? Was that too insensitive? Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Moving on. I want to take a look at the next one here. Uh, snag an authentic piece of the Buffalo Bills AstroTurf for a great cause. The Bills Mafia, listen up. What is, is that? Are those the fans of the Buffalo Bills? The Bills Mafia? Oh, wait a second. Wait yep. a second. Do you not know what the Bills Mafia is? Do you think I watch pro football? I okay. live in Knoxville, Jay Tennessee. Pink. There is only, only UT football, sir. <laughs> Maybe we <laughs> yeah. can branch out into the rest of the SEC. But Real quick, Jay Pink, pull, UT football. Just pull up on YouTube, like Bills Mafia. I just want to show Matt what they do in the tailgate lot. But anyway, anyway, while we're talking about this, real quick, they just you know, fight at least everybody. it's for a good cost. Amongst other things, yeah. yeah. So they're selling off, uh, uh, I guess you know, one foot by one foot or small pieces of sixty thousand seven hundred square feet of NFL regulation football field turf used by the Bills from twenty sixteen to twenty twenty one. Did they go back to grass or did they put in new turf? Uh, wall new hangs, turf. doormat sizes, yoga mats, and other small medium sizes are only available at in person events. However, half the proceeds of each sale goes to the Courage of Carly Fund at Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. In Buffalo, <laughs> New York. What is this, this guy doing? This is what they do. This is Bill's They're mafia. Table dude. jumping. Look at this guy. Yeah. He is so proud of himself. There's there's so many more of these. It's uh this looks like Neil yeah. on a Saturday. I mean, there's it, it's in Buffalo, it's in Can this. Buffalo, Canada. Let's just see what this guy does. What's he what's he gonna I'm do? I'm just gonna send it. Yeah, bud. Hey bud. Here he goes. It's so a standing long jump right here. Hey, bud. Hey, bud. Oh, he's got the dance oh, moves. Gonna, elbow. Gonna... More dance moves. It's a pow. Look at that guy right there. So you can he take this you can take this turf, Ray, and just bandage up all your wounds, right? You know, you uh, <laughs> lacerate, your, lacerate your forearm, you know, maybe uh, slice your sartorius in half, you know, across your thigh there. Whatever. You just patched up a little bit of turf. You know, you get some of those snot rockets that the pro football players, you know, put on there. Maybe a little bit of puke. Who knows what else is on there? I've heard about offensive because... linemen pissing their pants during the game because they don't want to go use the restroom. Offensive Ray, is, is this just... secretly what you do on the weekends? Are you are you one of these guys that that goes and cheers on a sports he team runs and the, jumps off tables? He runs no, the Hawaii, not at Hawaii all. tailgate. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. He's out not there at all. clearing <laughs> six foot beer bongs. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Ray the tank. Ray the tank. Ray the tank. <laughs> Two fisting. Almost. Look at this guy. Oh yeah. man! On top of <laughs> is that a Bears fan? Did he do that to a Bears fan? Who is the who are the Bills no. like? Arch nemesis. Patriots, Jets, the Pats. Jets. Um, yeah. Here, look at all these. If look at all these right. people hold their phones up. Look at these idiots. Jeez. They know it's coming. He's got a chicken involved. 
Oh, she threw him off. Look at, and is she going to jump on top of him afterwards? Oh, God. Uh, no. Imagine if you do, like, seriously, no. if you're at, like, a Home Depot there and you sell the folding tables, like, it's it's got to be a big business. I would really love to see, like, uh, the this sales the stats, right? Yes. <laughs> Oh my god. All right, moving on. moving on. Key provisions in California gasoline equipment ban help the green industry. Yeah, we got a little report here. Turns out the ban and for those that aren't familiar, we talked about it here before. Uh California was on a crash course to hurry up and get rid of uh gas powered engines, including uh equipment that would be less than 25 horsepower. Well, they put it back before and they wrote in some language here to protect uh lawn care and well mainly i think it was more the to protect golf courses than it was lawn care but by proxy it did it's help them too, yeah. affecting lawn care as well too so pretty pretty interesting little little sensibility there and i like that yeah there are some really interesting things i thought in here to kind of help out right so I think the the biggest one is they left themselves a lot of wiggle room, like in terms of what was practicable right now and what they might be able to do in the future, right? In terms of the actual technology existing, right? So, you know, in here, in determining technological feasibility pursuant to paragraph one, the state control board shall consider the following emissions from small off-road engines in the state, basically saying, hey, if they're not too bad, which they are kind of bad, but uh, you can keep going with them expected timelines for zero emission small off-road equipment development so that one's kind of a, a moving target there increased demand for electricity from the added charging requirements for more zero emission small off-road equipment i thought this one was the most interesting one because like you know we have already got rolling blackouts and brownouts in california as it is so you can't tell me that mm -hmm. throwing uh another uh two million you know 12 to 15 amp chargers on the grid is going to help anybody's day out at all uh let's see here use cases of both commercial and residential lawn and garden users and then a, and then this is this was kind of the weird one right so like they outlawed generators too which if you think about california right like people think you know southern california densely populated san francisco all that but the vast majority of california is very not necessarily remote but very uh agrarian right central valley yeah and you get the mountains you get sierra nevada you get uh you know there's so using generators right and i understand that there's a forest fire risk there's all this there's all that but it's like you gotta uh, this is where i'm saying that there's just not a whole lot of thought being put into this like hey we want to get rid of gas small gas engines agree they're terrible they're you know eight times worse than cars are in terms of their emissions and greenhouse gases all this and that and the other thing right but do we even have the infrastructure, right. the technology, all this other stuff to support them? No, not yet. But this is one that's going to make somebody feel good about, hey, we legislated it, we made it real, and now we're going to let some uh, appointed officials, right, at the California Air Resource Board, Ray, deal with all the bullshit and trying to figure out how to make it work. We did our part to get reelected. Peace. However, that's, uh, I mean, that's, that's how it is. E even, uh, even that re-election bit uh the dear governor barely made it through his recall okay he barely made I it, it i mean better. i think it was better than barely i think but then the fact that he was but, even up for recall says something yeah. in that he's managed to piss off enough people to the point where they want him gone but my question is uh are we as an industry kind of part of this too? Because guess what? I get into fights with, you know, regarding uh, the green industry equipment. What is my biggest fight? Uh, I'm going to say the rotary scissors. No. Neighbors? Come, it comes on to something. Where? No. No, it comes down to something even more basic. Two cycle versus four cycle engines. Oh, and when yeah. I say four cycle engine when I say four cycle engines, I mean the engines where oil is not mixed into the gasoline at all. It's kept separate. 
at all times. Because, Ryan, everything mm-hmm. that I run that is gasoline is all for a cycle. All of it. Mm. Absolutely, totally all of it. Even things that you think would otherwise be two cycle. Uh, mm-hmm. I have them running as four cycle. Mm-hmm. And and even then, I think it's still, I agree that, you know, the two cycles had much dirtier engine and all that, but just don't see how we can move this far this fast. I will be very interested, right, to see, because now think about this if you're a manufacturer, right, that, yeah, there's a state that's got 50 million people in it that has moved this direction, right, but what about the other 49 states, right? Like, is there that big of a push in these other places to make it economically feasible for them to push a bunch of R&D dollars, production, changing their lines and everything like that to really gear up and do this, right? Because there's a lot of smaller entrants. You know, steel has a good line of, of small handheld stuff, but as far as the bigger stuff and like really gearing up to make it widely available, not necessarily commercially available because it's already there, but widely available, what does that roadmap look like? And eh, I don't know. I don't want to be the naysayer, but I'll be anxious to see how um, how much demand is there at first how quickly it paces up and then uh, how much, how much the green industry as a whole tries to hold back some of that development so they can keep what they know works and what they're comfortable with and all that. I I have a serious question here and I don't, I don't know the answer to this. How much lithium can be mined to support a lithium ion battery world? I mean, is there, is there Afghanistan ample? and Venezuela and where where else are the lithium deposits? China, right? Yeah, China, China, <laughs> China. yeah, China, yeah, yeah, China. So, <sighs> my question is because is that they're going to nuke? You. There's, yeah, you don't have to worry about it. No, there's solid lithium mines, nice. and there's also a certain amount of lithium that comes up in brine wells. However. Let me ask you guys this. Do you know what it's like trying to put out a metallic lithium fire? Oh, yeah, you can't, right? You just have to let it go. Yeah, yeah, chemical reaction, right? It just keeps going and going and going. yeah, Yeah, because lithium reacts with all other elements. So then here's my question. How would I feel? about having all of these hot battery packs riding shotgun with me every day versus what was the issue? I know I, I I know I carry a couple gallons of gas with me but the gasoline is kept in a place where it's safe so remind me cuz <laughs> I don't want to go look it up right now but what was the issue with the lithium batteries traveling on airplanes and some of the explosions and fires that they were having way back when they would spontaneously overheat and then ignite they would ignite spontaneously Ryan and there was when you have a, a lithium out. fire on an on an aircraft uh filled with oxygen bad yeah, yeah, filled with pressurized air. That, that's like not not good juju there. That's uh, I remember <laughs> one, Samsung I a... had the exploding uh, phone issue, and that was due to a manufacturing defect, I believe, was putting undue mm-hmm. pressure onto the battery and uh, and putting a bend into it that would cause it to swell and ignite. If I recall correctly. Well, well gee, I mean, uh, shut it, oh, isn't that go. shut it? Is it? Isn't that why our, our, our good friend, uh, you know, Steve Vetter has that little thing that you're supposed Jeez. to put your electronics in when you, when you charge oh them? <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> so, there have been three, three incidents of plane crashes. Uh, DC-8, that's a long time ago. It's a DC-8. There was one in 2010, though. It was a UPS 747 carrying packages, and it blew up going to Dubai. Mm-hmm. And then, and then even here locally, there have been instances of somebody charging their 
lithium ion cell that they use in their RC, uh, you know, toy car, guess what happens? That goes off and then the entire house burns down. So all cheers. You know, yeah. So my, my rules for, you know, lithium batteries is when I charge them, they get charged outside and my eye is on them at all times while they are charging. Just because. And there you well, have it. Yeah. There you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Uh I, you know, yeah. Lit lithium does make me a little nervous just because I've played around with it before. Um and but <laughs> here's also too, if you're going a little crazy, you can always just take some. I hear it chills you out. It's mood stabilizer in some parts <laughs> of, of the medical industry. Actually, you know, let's check out and uh, see no. what's going on uh in the in the mailbag. <laughs> You've got mail. <laughs> All right. Now, question number one here is from Michael. Michael said, several YouTubers recommend adding organic material products to your lawn. Is that necessary in a cost-effective way when mulch grass and leaves are freely available and sometimes excessively available? Here's a link to an article on mulching uh, leaves, and it was in USA Today. And uh, I don't know if I even want to read this article. Oh, it's saying you don't need to rake your leaves. Experts explain why. You should mow your leaves. Because it can recycle nutrients and blah 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 blah. The natural um, from the National huh. Wildlife Federation. That's that's the uh, answer. What do, what yeah. do they know about fine turf? What do they know about um, fine turf, guys? Not much of anything. And Mike, Michael, let's see. There's there's a thousand different ways to answer this question. But in short, do you need to? No. Should you? That's entirely up to you. Um. Here's the thing. When you add organic material to a lawn, let's think about it from this, this perspective, right? A furrow slice of soil weighs 2 million pounds. And let's say you go pick up a product that you apply at 100 pounds to the acre. Well, let's do a more realistic number. You apply it at 400 pounds to the acre. So we know a furrow slice of soil is 2 million pounds. You add 400 pounds. So you are affecting approximately, oh, uh, what is that? 0.02% of the soil. And in terms of how much impact is that really going to have over a short amount of time? Not much. What you're getting out of that organic material is N, P, and K. And there's cheaper, more cost-effective ways and more uh, uh, efficient ways of getting the N, P, and K down. The fastest way to generate or raise organic matter in your soil is through an adequate uh, MPK program. Good agronomy will raise your organic matter levels in your soil faster than any other amending way unless you come in and just rebuild your soil structure. So um, do you have to do it that way? Can you do it with just your mulch grass and leaves that are freely coming down? Yeah. And that makes a ton of sense. What ma makes the most sense though is, is following good agronomic practices uh, to make sure all of that when combined together gives you the ultimately desired output which is a kick-ass lawn right and that begins and ends with agronomy couldn't have said it better myself i yeah save the money yeah. spend it on something that's basic and beneficial there and don't worry too much about the other stuff right now uh frank also said here is a granular spreadable urea 4600 the same thing as spraying a soluble urea at the end of the season before the first snowfall uh yes yes nope. urea is urea and, is urea and in fact uh ryan correct me if i'm wrong mm -hmm. it, in a cool season lawn it may be a good idea to apply a total of one pound of nitrogen which translates to 2.2 .2 pounds of urea mm -hmm. as in two applications the last months before you close out your season on a cool season lawn. Yeah. To build yeah, up, you can to build up nitrogen, build up nitrogen reserves. Yeah. It's, it's, it's building some, up carbohydrate, carbohydrate reserves carbohydrate. in the roots. And so you can, you can definitely do that. Um, you know, if you're in a cool season lawn in a setting like that right now, I'd make a, a half pound application now and a half pound application, oh, in another couple of weeks and not really much more after that. Uh, there's a recent research shows that 
getting into November, right? That we're we're losing daylight, we're losing um, you know the plant's natural ability to need water, right? To take water up because mm. its needs for that mm -hmm. consumption are going down. Therefore, a lot of what gets applied kind of after that November one date uh, is not necessarily rendered ineffective. It's just not taken up. So, uh, depending on where you're at and how far north you are, um, you know, do one half pound application, right? And if you've got uh, consistent moisture, right, from rainfall, um, if you ha still have your irrigation on, you can back off a little bit. But you know, the plant needs to be ta actively taking in water for it to take that nitrogen up for the most part. So you can spray, you know, we talked, you asked the question about spraying. You can spray lower amounts of that. I would not spray half a pound of nitrogen all at one time uh, with urea. No. Uh, unless you're feeling no, real dangerous. <laughs> um, but I would, I, what I would say too, is that if you're interested in spraying it and you're further north, then I would um, recommend that you go out with a quarter pound now and maybe another quarter pound in uh, another couple of weeks or so, and then just call it a year. You know, if you're, if you're willing to spray it, I think you're going to get more bang for your buck going that way uh, than going too high. Uh, so it just really depends on your, your geographic location. Do we have that, Jay Ping, by the way, where, where he's from? Uh, we do not. Planet Earth. So, yes. Yes. And I'm going to assume that somebody Maybe. asking about that at this time of the year is probably dealing with cool season grass because... Uh, Consensus is is that this time of the year for us uh, southern people, we really ought to be tailing off our nitrogen applications because the grass is about to go dormant and it doesn't want excessive carbohydrates going into winter. Ray, Ray I saw a picture on Facebook that somebody sent me of uh, somebody scalping Bermuda today. Oh, good. Oh, really? I hope they have oh, a lovely. good OA program. Um, hey, Ryan, real quick. He, Frank had written in previously, and we at least know he has Fescue and Kentucky Blue, but that's as much as mm -hmm. we know. Spread as it, spray it, whatever you got. Just put it down. Do it. Yeah, now would be the yeah, appropriate time to do it. Uh, and do it. Whatever's easiest for you. If you want to spread it, spread it. If you want to spray it, spray it. You, you win either yep. way, I promise you. Yep. All right, that is going to bring cool. us to the end of the episode here. Gentlemen, I want to thank you all for tuning along. Don't forget, coming up uh, on Thursday, well, damn it, we're going to be broadcasting live from an unknown location as of right Are now. We uh, but we will be coming from Louisville, Kentucky at our very first Thirsty Thursday live burn and return live event in Louisville, Kentucky. If you would like to hang around with us for a little while and pick the title of this show, you can check us out over in the thread on Dirty Deeds. Hashtag Dirty Deeds on the Discord. We'll see you there. Gentlemen, it's been a real pleasure. We'll catch y'all on the flip side.